Thank you so much, Eve, for that very thoughtful introduction. I want to reciprocate that. It was a real pleasure to work with Eve and Kat, whom I saw, oh, there in the front, uh, throughout the last year of this uh, work on the 250th. And, and I, I've worked on a number of institutional history projects at different institutions, and this was by far the most seamless and fun internal history project that I've ever worked on. I think that says a lot about Brown University. Um, were all of you at the campus dance last night? Because you are truly dedicated students of Brown's history to be here in the, the not so coveted 9 a.m. slot uh, after the campus dance. I live about 12 blocks away from here and I could hear the campus dance quite audibly throughout the evening and was jolted out of bed at between 12 midnight and 12.04 for the fireworks. I was trying to think about what a Baptist founder of Brown University in the 18th century might have thought if they'd stumbled onto the green and heard the music and seen the gyrations, including of people much too old to be gyrating, and um, seen the fireworks. And I, I think they would have thought that um, the end of the world had, had come. And that is not necessarily a bad thing if you're an 18th century Baptist, because it implies a form of redemption. Redemption was a word they often used. And I think in some ways they would feel, and we could argue that Brown has redeemed the original promise of 1764 and the founding of this institution, which was called the College of Rhode Island or, or Rhode Island College when it was founded. And to unite the pretty distant hopes of Brown at its founding in 1764 with the modern university, a very complicated university, was a major goal for me in this publication, which has just come out. It came out about two weeks ago, and we have copies outside for sale if you haven't acquired yours yet. And it's not the easiest thing to do to unite two periods 250 years apart, but I think it worked. And I think part of the reason it worked is that um, Brown's, Brown does have a verifiable DNA that goes back to the beginning. Um, we don't go around predicting the end of the world quite as often as the um, religious enthusiasts of the mid 18th century did, but there was certainly a feeling of unorthodoxy which was a word they used at the, at the beginning of Brown's experiment, and that's very much in the air. And there was always a feeling of um, strong self-reliance and a deep belief in individual freedoms of, of expression. They might have defined those freedoms slightly different from the way we do, but a lot of, um, of, of the, the characteristics of the modern university that we know and love were, were certainly there at the beginning. And for me, it really was a pleasure to do this project. As, as Eve mentioned, I, I grew up on the Brown campus, uh, the, the son of a former faculty member, Eric Widmer, and friends with many uh, former faculty members. And I want to salute Tom Gleason. Tom and Sarah Gleason are in the back. And Tom is uh, one of my earliest friends on this campus. And there were, there were many others. And I think when you grow up on a campus, you sometimes identify more with the spirit of the, the institution than if you actually go to the college. And in my case, I have a, a horribly embarrassing admission to make, which is that I, I did not actually go to Brown University, even though I'm, I'm currently Brown's, uh, Brown's historian. I went to an obscure university about 45 miles to the north of Brown University, whose name I will not mention. But um, that institution, Exactly, exactly. And that institution was very helpful to me throughout the writing of this, this book because I needed a villain. And in many ways, that institution, which begins with the letter H, um, was the perfect foil for Brown. And it, it's fun to make fun of that institution from our modern point of view. But in fact, the founders of Brown felt very keenly that educational opportunity was limited in colonial New England because of this 
giant and not very scintillating presence in Cambridge, Massachusetts that was trying to dominate intellectually the entire region of New England, and not only trying to dominate it uh, in terms of um, known disciplines, but very, very much in the sort of religion, the way people went about their lives and thought about society and taking forms of instruction from accredited experts in subjects who had to have gone to that institution. And New England was already a pretty complicated place, and Rhode Island was especially a complicated place that had originated in opposition to the way the founders of Boston and Cambridge wanted to organize a hierarchical society. So from the very beginning, in fact, of Rhode Island, not just of Brown University, there was a feeling that in fact, society does not have to be hierarchical. Society can be organized very differently. And so when Brown was founded uh, well over 100 years into the experiment of Rhode Island, it, it was not only a new kind of educational institution, but it was trying to legitimize a different way of thinking about social life, about how, how people relate to their government and, and to each other. And in thinking about why I was so excited to write this book, I thought a little bit about my own life, and uh, if you are a fan of the movies of Wes Anderson, as so many people are, there's always something happening to a kind of alert 11 or 12 or 13 year old. And going back in my own life, I remember this seminal moment, which was the Harvard, oh, I said it, um, <laughs> the Harvard Brown football game of approximately 1975 in, in Harvard Stadium, said it again, in, uh, in Cambridge. And during the halftime show, the Harvard band came out, and even though we we're well into the 1970s, perhaps the most chaotic decade of all time, the Harvard band was marching in um, kind of depressing precision with their crimson blazers and their white pants and their perfect formation. And they did a sort of tedious routine of the uh, 10 or 20 songs about how great Harvard is. And uh, then they dutifully marched into one of those uh, exit ramps. And then there was uh, some silence. And then a totally different sounding voice came onto the PA system. And you could just feel the um, sarcasm and the chaos and the humor in that voice before the band even came. Are any of you former members of the Brown Band? And um, it just began, ladies and gentlemen. And the, I think the band started running out before the announcement was even made. And Helter Skelter, all over the place, forget about formation, and sang and played um, the the Brown songs, but then also a lot of other songs, all of which were ir highly irreverent toward Harvard and toward Richard Nixon, if he was even still the president, um, if it was before 1974, and, and it was wonderful. And so I was captivated. And ever since that moment, I was a, really much more of a fan of Brown University than of any other. And I, so I, I told you where I went, but I always cheered for the Brown sports teams throughout my, my four years. And so to, to get the assignment of writing this book was um, no duty. It was really a, a kind of joy for me to write. So um, let me talk about the book a little bit. And in, in today's remarks, I, I'd like to talk for maybe 30 minutes and not more than that and take your questions because I think it's more fun to do it that way. And it's also more Brown-like to give a, a, a wandering lecture with occasional um, thoughts about, about, um, how, about society than a strictly hierarchical Harvard type of lecture. So the, the book, uh, we all knew, had to be part of the 250th ceremony um, remembrance. And I thought it made sense to have five chapters that covered about 50 years in each chapter. And, and so that is the basic layout of, of the book. And as I said, I wanted to go deeply into the origins of Brown because I think they're very important. And have, having been the director of the John Carter Brown Library, I spent a lot of time in colonial history and colonial literature. And the, the, the colonial past here in Rhode Island is unusually interesting. So Rhode Island began, as I said, in, in a 
very interesting act of rebellion against uh, hierarchy. And I tried to take a little time to get right with that story. It's, it's not only the story of Roger Williams, who's very famous here within Rhode Island, but also of other dissenters who came to the, the welcoming shores of Narragansett Bay, including in the 16th century, the great Italian explorer Verrazzano, whose name we know from the Verrazzano Bridge in, in New York, came here as early as 1524, so not too long after Columbus has discovered the, uh, this, this hemisphere, Verrazzano sails into Narragansett Bay and is so impressed by the quality of the landscape and of the, the human beings who lived here, who were very welcoming to him, that he gave it an interesting name on a map that he made, uh, Refugio. He called it a, a place of refuge here, which Rhode Island never lost that, that feeling, that it was a place where you could come if you didn't fit into other places. And that was absolutely what happened to Roger Williams in 1636. He, he came with high hopes of becoming a leading minister and teacher to the, the Puritan colony developing very rapidly around Boston and quickly figured out that he didn't fit in. He didn't fit in for religious reasons, but also for political reasons. He didn't like the way that the Massachusetts leaders were um, taking land from the Native Americans. He didn't like the way that they were mixing up religion and politics. And he thought all of the above should be a more deeply individualistic matter, that people should have the freedom to think for their, themselves. And when he was told that he could not, he said, fine, and he left to the, he, he went into the wilderness. And, and there's a picture of the compass he used, which is currently in Manning Chapel. And uh, he found his way here. And the Boston authorities quickly realized to their horror that they had banished Roger Williams to a much more beautiful part of, of New England. And that began about 150 years of real estate tension between Boston and Providence. And in that battle, Roger Williams really won. He, he won in an amazing way. And I think this part of the story does resonate for the future of Brown University because he he always had a do-it-yourself kind of a mentality. When he ran into obstacles in, in the known f way of doing something, he would just try a different way of doing it until he got it right to his satisfaction. And in his case, I just want to pause for a second to say what he did because it's, it, it, the more I think about it, and I have thought about it a lot, I think it's an absolutely unique founding of a state. Um, it was a colony before it was a state, but all of the other colonies began with a significant land grant made in England to either an individual like William Penn or a group of individuals who just sketched out some territory on the map and used their power networks in, in London to get a grant and then came over here and settled that area. What Roger Williams did is much more interesting. He had ended up here because he was banished and no one knew what this area was. It was outside the Massachusetts jurisdiction and in fact it was in no jurisdiction. And Roger Williams got to know the Native Americans. He went to a completely different group of people, the Indians, and he asked for their permission to live here and they granted it and then he, he purchased the land that we um, are, are standing on now from them. And still didn't have a colony as defined in England, but began to write about the Indians. And he wrote a book in 1643 called A Key into the Language of America that electrified London society for being the, the best anthropological study of the very interesting people who lived here before the Europeans came over. And as a result of that book, he was able to find entree into political circles that he had not been able to find entree into. And through that, um, established a claim to found a colony around his much different, his very different idea of how to live with the Native Americans. So it was a kind of utopian experiment in multiculturalism that London approved. And no other colony was founded in, in anything like that way. And certainly no other colony began with the writing of a book. So Rhode Island, which Massachusetts always looked down upon as being sort of beyond the pale and not, not nearly as intellectual, in fact, 
was founded much more in the act of book writing than Massachusetts was. So ideas were always important here, and ideas of freedom of expression were especially important. And when the Baptists come into the picture in the, in the middle of the um, 18th century, and they're looking for a place to found a university, it fits that their hopes landed on, on this hill, because the Baptists were especially proud of their freedom of expression. And the specific right that they really felt very keenly was the right to not be taxed for the support of religions that they did not support. And well into the founding, well into the existence of the United States, uh, all people were taxed to support the official state religion of a, of a state. In, in Massachusetts until 1833, you paid a tax to support the puritanical, the, the descendants of the puritanical churches. And the Baptists hated it, it was not enough to have freedom of religion. They, they insisted vehemently that they didn't want to pay into the support of rival denominations. And that, that very strong political belief that was attached to their religious beliefs was essentially the reason that we have the establishment clause of the Constitution, the First Amendment. It's the most important part of the First Amendment that we will establish no that we, we will um, support no established religion. And the word established means official state religion. And that is the uh, legacy of the Baptists of the 18th century. And their great citadel for developing this thought was the College of, of Rhode Island. So from the very beginning, this uh, small college was founded with, with big ideas about self-determination and how individuals relate to their, their government. Um, from the founding, uh, Brown had a, had a slightly rocky beginning. It was founded, as many of you know, in Warren, Rhode Island, and not in Providence, and it lasted there for only five years. And it's a little bit of a mystery why Brown had to leave Warren, Rhode Island, but I discovered in my research that in the year 1768, Warren uh, built two pillories. Pillories are those wooden structures that you have to put your head and arms into if you have misbehaved. And it's, I think, no coincidence that uh, this, this small educational institution felt a need to leave Warren right around that moment. Um, in other ways, it was going very well. The, the faculty-student ratio couldn't have been better. It was one-to-one -one in the year 1765 because there was one member of the faculty and only one student. <laughs> Um, th that student was a 14-year-old boy from Newport, Rhode Island, named William Rogers. But uh, Brown attracted high-quality students from the very beginning. And if the numbers were small, they, they were impressive people, as became clear over the next 20, 30 years when they played an um, important role in the American Revolution. By the way, um, now that we're in the year 2015, we can breathe a sigh of relief that we dodged the 50th anniversary curse, which I, I figured out in my research. Every 50 years of Brown's celebrations of, of its anniversaries, there's been a pretty major war in American history. So um, 1814 is the year the British burn the White House. 1864, one of the worst years of the Civil War. 1914, the outbreak of the First World War. 1964, the beginning of the Vietnam War, and then 2014, we, we made it through without any, any serious conflict. So I think we're, in many ways, we're getting it right um, well into our history. Um, the, the American Revolution was a, a shock, to put it mildly, to, to Brown's uh, infant campus. And I, I go into great detail about why Brown moved to Providence, which in, in, in many ways came as a surprise to a lot of people in Rhode Island because Providence was, was very much the junior city to Newport in 1769 and 1770, but I go into some <coughs> detail about why I felt the energy here was better for a new, a new country, a, a new college and, uh, and a new country because Providence, as, as events made clear, became the more important center of resistance to, to England than Newport had been. Um, but Newport was important in the founding, too, and Newport had also been a place that hoped to have a college. Uh, the great 
Anglo-Irish philosopher George Berkeley had spent time in Newport in the 1740s and 50s, and while there had very publicly called for a, a Rhode Island college to be created. So I, I trace some of those early strands in my, in my first chapter. Uh, my second chapter, called Brown Baptized, talks about uh, the naming of Brown in 1804, when it gets the name we all know today, and its um, growing pains in the early decades when there was a remarkable amount of student violence, some of which is still traceable on campus in bits of graffiti, including one very funny one on uh, University Hall, which is still there to this day, was covered up by some shrubbery until, until recently. And I talk about uh, another great revolution that was happening around this campus and this city, which was the Industrial Revolution of the early 19th century, in which Rhode Island really played a very leading role in, in all of the United States. And how that helped Brown in many ways. It brought much needed money into the coffers that were none too full in the early decades and helped the campus to expand beyond University Hall to the other buildings uh, adjacent to it, but also brought some tensions as um, Rhode Island and Providence experienced growing pains in the, the growth of, a, of um, a kind of industrial class of work, workers who didn't fit clearly in, into um, all of the utopian democratic pronouncements about this country that were, were coming frequently from leaders, but were not always justified by, by facts on the ground. Um, but Brown, I think, worked out these tensions pretty, pretty well, as it always has. Um, and it, it did that with the careful study of government. It did it with some interesting new initiatives, including a first med school. There was a, a really promising med school of the 18 teens and 20s that ended when Francis Whalen became president. And it, it did it the way Brown always has done things well through the simple act of teaching brilliantly, and that was becoming clear in Brown's story in these early decades of the 19th century, that Brown really had wonderful faculty members from, from the beginning. Uh, my third chapter is called Bookends, and it considers the different careers of John Hay and John Rockefeller Jr., whose libraries face each other in front of the Van Wickle Gates. The Van Wickle Gates are very important to this book, and the, the book begins in front of the Van Wickle Gates as a kind of crucial place to figure out Brown's identity. And I, in the very first sentence, uh, compare the iconography of those gates to what a, a young student at uh, Hogwarts might be thinking. Uh, and, and in my experience, whenever you're having trouble making an academic kind of point to a group of young students, Mentioning Harry Potter never fails. So I, 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 I tried to hook them in. I tried to hook them in at the very beginning. You can tell when left to my own devices, I go a little too far into colonial history. And so I thank God for Harry Potter to keep me, keep me out of that. Um, and in the, in the third chapter, Brown really begins to um, get get different and to get interesting and just to to leave its origins as a strongly Baptist institution for young Protestant men, mainly from southeastern New England, and to begin to admit very different kind of people. And the story of the admission of African Americans is an amazing story. And the first African American alumnus of Brown is an amazing person who has all of the great qualities of Brown, uh, including that he became a, a really remarkable teacher of others in his own right. And his name was Inman Page. And he was a member of the class of 1877. And one of the great stories, I, I felt very lucky in the writing of this book because I kept stumbling upon these uh, amazing stories that spanned the century. And one, one of them involves Inman Page. Uh, so he's class of 1877, as I said. He's a young African-American slave who is uh, becomes free. I think he probably ran away from the carnage of the Civil War. He's from Virginia uh, as, a, as a teenager, makes it to Washington, D.C., where he begins to impress people with his intelligence. And he's finally sent up here. It's a little unclear why he came up to Providence, but um, that he did. And 
uh, it was just the right moment. There had been some agitation for Brown to open its doors to African Americans, but they had not yet. But he arrived right at the right moment, and he became valedictorian of the class of 1877, and gave a beautiful speech about what education had meant to him, and then became a lifelong educator, primarily in the Southwest, uh, in Tennessee and Mississippi, that was the Southwest then, and uh, ultimately in Oklahoma, where he became an educator for 50 years, and near the end of his life was the high school principal of a very talented young writer named Ralph Ellison, who became the great mid-20th century novelist who wrote Invisible Man, one of the, the seminal books of African-American literature. And in 1979, 102 years after Inman Page graduated from Brown, Ralph Ellison, who by then was an old man, came here to give a talk. And in the course of his talk, I think he'd been invited just to talk about being Ralph Ellison, he changed the topic to the legacy of Inman Page upon Ralph Ellison. And it was this incredible moment where 102 years later, the life of a Brown undergraduate who happened to be the first African-American undergraduate suddenly came alive through the words of Ralph Ellison. And he said he never would have become a writer without Inman Page. And he told a hilarious story of the most embarrassing moment of his life when he was supposed to give a student oration. And he was standing behind the principal, Inman Page, uh, about to go on stage before his high school in Oklahoma, and a rope that was ringing the bell, calling everyone into the assembly, caught him and Inman Page together and pulled them up and then dropped them down in a giant mess on the stage in front, of, and the whole crowd exploded in laughter, and Ralph Ellison ran out of the room thinking he'd probably been expelled and came back the next day to gather his belongings, and Inman Page couldn't suppress a chuckle. He was trying to discipline him and couldn't stop laughing, and that double voice of sort of laughter and authority at the same time stayed in the mind of Ralph Ellison and led him to want to write in a way that reflected a kind of double voice, which is the theme of Invisible Man. And so it's a beautiful tribute to Brown from someone who didn't actually go to Brown, but um, but bringing back to life the, the career of Inman Page, the first black alumnus. The story of women coming to Brown is also incredible and also uh, reflects on some agitation well before women actually came to Pembroke, what became known as Pembroke. And, uh, um, in 1891 is the year women first begin to receive instruction here, but they always had been important. Uh, on campus as sisters and daughters and mothers of Brown students, but um, also as students in their own right, auditing classes without being able to, to officially graduate or attending the university grad, uh, um, uh, grammar school, which was on this campus. And when the moment fit finally came in 1891, it was clear that it was the right thing to do. And it was clear to Brown male undergraduates pretty quickly because um, women were immediately outperforming their male counterparts, but also the faculty really, really got behind it. And a very important president, Benjamin Andrews, was um, the real spearhead of, of that effort. So I try to tell the stories of how Brown kept living up to its founding creed, not by staying the same, but by getting better and better and refusing to, to maintain a, st a status quo that if it were maintained, would have resulted in, in mediocrity rather than excellence. Um, I always tell sidebar stories throughout the writing of this book, and one of the better ones I, I found is that the first display of a, the throwing of a curveball took place right next to University Hall. Um, a, a, a young star pitcher claimed that he could throw a ball that curved, and his physics professor said it was impossible. So they had a scientific display, and that is the birth of um, the curve ball. And I think, what, what an appropriate pitch for Brown University. Um, a, a fastball would have been far less interesting. Um, my fourth chapter is called Dance of the Brownies, and I didn't realize I would be giving a talk it, so, so 
close upon the heels of the campus dance, but that is, is kind of an appropriate title. Um, it was a kind of a, an event here at Brown around the turn of the century called the Dance of the Brownies. And in, in this section, I talk about the, the rise of the modern university and the greatness of two presidents, um, William Fonts and uh, Henry Wriston, each of whom really took the university to a very different place from where it had been before. Fonts is fascinating for a lot of reasons, including his lifelong friendship with John D. Rockefeller Jr., who finally helped Brown uh, in many ways to enter the big leagues and to afford projects that it never had been able to afford before. And I found very movingly in my research that they were really important warriors for religious tolerance in their, in their time in a way that never called attention to themselves, but which was very courageous all the same. And within the Baptist church, there were bitter controversies in the 19-teens and 20s over um, still pretty, pretty forceful currents of, of fundamentalist religious thinking. And you might remember the, the Scopes trial controversy of 1925 or the teaching of evolution controversies that have not entirely disappeared almost 100 years later. And throughout those controversies, uh, Fonts and Rockefeller were, were a very strong team for tolerance and for modernism within religion. And I think Brown can feel proud of, of who they were. Brown faculty and alumni were also very important in the uh, confusing aftermath of World War I when there was a lot of tension about Im immigrants and left-wing thinking in this country. Brown faculty and alums were very eloquent in defining the rights of Sorry, uh, dissenters to, to, uh, to also speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, the but years 1914 to 1919 were years of intense activity on this, on this campus. And our class I kept finding that you know, Brown, Brown really changed during the great <laughs> military we efforts can't, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, and I found myself powerfully drawn to those stories. But, um, I wonder if different speak, stories from the ones that I want to be telling in Brown's famously uh, liberal, of course, and um, we started in the 1960s and 70s was, was uh, pretty clearly against the war effort. But in those earlier wars, Brown was just as clearly behind war efforts, and I found that the ways in which that happened and the way military construction took place was very interesting and, and very moving. So there's a fair amount of that in this book. Um, 1916 is an especially big year for Brown. It's the year, amazingly, that Brown's football team uh, played in the Rose Bowl. I don't dwell too long on the final score of that game, which uh, Brown was on the losing side, as it so often was in football. But uh, the great importance of, of the fact that it got into the Rose Bowl at all. The Rose Bowl hadn't been a great football game until very recently. It had been an ostrich race in, in Pasadena. So they were still trying to figure out what the Rose Bowl actually was going to be. But um, as they were experimenting with football, Brown happened to have a very good team that was willing to come east. And as I studied that, team a little more carefully, I became aware of the importance of a single athlete in Brown's story. And there always were these individual stories that were really moving to me. There was a young African-American football player named uh, Fritz Pollard, named after Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass Pollard, whose mother worked for a Brown alumnus in Chicago. And she urged him to simply come to Brown to, to look at it in hopes of coming. And he came up the hill and looked at the Van Wickle gates and wasn't sure even how to get in, but began to knock on doors and was in, amazingly admitted. And he turned out to be the best football player uh, in the Ivy League or perhaps any, any league in the 19-teens and helped Brown to become a really powerful football team and as I read uh, articles in the Brown Alumni, what was then the Brown Alumni Monthly and, and other Brown publications, it was really fun to read about him because he was a, a great force for racial integration around the Ivy Leagues. And it was especially, to go back to the Harvard-Brown tension, Harvard was so frustrated by 
its experience playing against Brown in the Fritz Pollard years because the Harvard-Brown game had essentially been a kind of tune-up for the Yale game for Harvard and they would send their B team um, or their younger players in for a not very important game and they wouldn't even come to Providence. That's how arrogant the Harvard football team was. They always insisted that Brown come to Cambridge and in the Pollard years, Har Brown starts beating Harvard pretty badly and Harvard starts bringing out its real varsity and still losing. And in, the, in, in Pollard's senior year, Harvard lost 21 to nothing. And there are these wonderful soul-searching articles in the Harvard Crimson about how good Brown is. And maybe, um, maybe Brown is a real university after, after all. I found a wonderful uh, write-up of a Brown-Harvard athletic contest in the 19th century in which Brown's style of play was a little more chaotic than Harvard's, and a Brown writer said this, seriously, he said this may be attributable to the different theological systems that our, our different universities or, originated with. And the final, uh, uh, after the, the Pollard years, I, I spend some time in the 1920s when I think Brown uh, continued to, to become much greater than it had been by opening itself up to the, the very different ki kinds of people who were living around Providence, uh, again, um, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, which was well into its second century. And I take an especially long time with two great Brunonians of the 1920s, S.J. Perlman, the great humor writer and New Yorker writer and Marx Brothers writer, and his brother-in-law, Nathaniel, West and Nathaniel West's story is just so good. He, he's the um, the great author of um, a, a number of satirical novels of the 1920s, *Day of the Locust*, um, being one of the most famous. And his story is is wonderful. He was basically a complete underachiever, and he, he was satirically nicknamed Pep Weinstein. His real name is Nathan Weinstein, and he once went on a small hike at a summer, his summer camp and slept through the entire next day and his friends nicknamed him Pep. And he couldn't get into college, but his parents found a way for him to get into Tufts University, which was easier to get into than, uh, than Brown or than just about any, any university. And while there, he flunked out of Tufts, but there was another student named Nathan Weinstein going to Tufts and he had that other student's transcript sent to Brown, and as a result, was admitted to Brown, where he suddenly emerged as a brilliant writer and became best friends with S.J. Perlman, who already was uh, a brilliant writer, and they fueled each other's uh, de de development and really, um, to no small degree, shaped uh, American literary culture of the 1920s and, and 30s. Uh, among other things, West gave us the name Homer Simpson, and if nothing else, I'm so happy that uh, we got the photograph of Otto, the bus driver on The Simpsons, into this book. Otto is a graduate of Brown University. <laughs> uh, I don't know why, but I think one of the writers of The Simpsons is, um, is a Brown alumnus. And then the final chapter is called The Brown Decades. And it's hard to write about more recent history for, for me. It's easier to go back into the deeper past but I wanted to get right with the last 50 years because obviously uh, they're a tremendously important time in the history of Brown and a tremendously uh, important vindication of all that had come before. And through these first 200 years, Brown had achieved teaching excellence and had attracted iconoclasts, really interesting undergraduates who had done impressive things here and there, but it, it had fallen short, I would say, of the, the, the definition of national and international greatness of, of the, the Harvards and Yales and, and Princetons, and that was largely due to lack of money and to a kind of um, regional focus that made Brown a very good place if you were from within 100 miles of Providence, but also meant that Brown was unlikely to get the great students from New York City or the South or the Midwest or the West, and all of that changed in the last 50 years. And I think it would be hard to find another example of a university 
that got that much better, that really achieved greatness as recently as Brown did. It's, it's a remarkably impressive achievement that I think all of you in this room should feel very good about. And my own memories go back long enough to the late 60s and the early 70s that I remember the kind of threadbare Brown University. I, I remember it with a lot of fondness. And it was around the site where we are that that ridiculously old-fashioned and tiny swimming pool was. Do any of you remember the Colgate Hoyt pool? Which, how could you even have a swim meet against another, unless you really practiced your turns? If you, which maybe is, is what happened. But I took swimming lessons there. And I, if you remember Marvel Gym, had a wooden track on the second floor that was one, I mean, these were wonderful places. And squash courts up on about the 17th floor of Marvel where the temperature kept dropping by 10 degrees every, every floor you went up. And Brown was um, just, just an older fashioned place with um, fewer modern facilities than its Ivy League rivals. And all of that changed dramatically over the last 50 years. And obviously, a big part of the change was what happened in the 1960s on this campus. And I think, unlike so many colleges, which had unhappy times in the 1960s, Brown really worked it out in a way that was principled and consensual and really smart. And the, the most famous of those changes was the new curriculum of 1969. And as I studied that, and I'm sure there are people in this room who were there um, in, an, in a, an immediate way, but it seemed like it wasn't exactly a student rebellion. It was a kind of gradual conversation that began with a class a class that looked into the history of curricular reform at Brown, of which there was, there was already a lot of interesting curricular reform that had happened that could be looked to for examples. And then um, drew upon the expertise of faculty who were obviously deeply interested in the question of how to teach on this campus. And then found an administration that was willing to let the experiment go forward. So it wasn't students chanting, outside University Hall and occupying it. It, w it was conversations uh, with other people of different generations who were interested in what the students had to say and permitted it to go forward. So that, that was a defining moment for Brown. It came exactly 200 years after the decision to move to Providence, 1769 and 1969. And I think 50, Year, almost 50 years later, it's pretty clear that Brown really got it right with the new curriculum. And it, it wasn't just right for the Brown of the 1960s, but it clearly became a very powerful re recruiting tool for the best high school students out there around the country and around the world who wanted to come to a university that took the ideas of young people very seriously and gave them not only freedom, which is something of an over rated concept in my mind, but also respect and self-discipline. Because the discipline to pick intelligent courses is a crucial part of the new curriculum. It's not just freedom to do basket weaving and macrame and whatever you want to do. It's the, the freedom to design a really smart curriculum that serves each individual's needs well. And so I found a lot of self-discipline inside of this story. And I think that also goes back to the 18th century when the Baptists and the Rhode Islanders didn't just found any college. They founded a, the college they, they wanted to found. And uh, then I, I, I do a kind of rapid romp through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and beyond. And I, I think Brown got very lucky in its presidents in those eras. And I, 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 I won't repeat the book, but I think Howard Swearer was a real um, tipping point for this university who radiated a kind of um, self-confidence that was important, that Brown no longer needed to feel like uh, 
uh, one of the lesser of the Ivy Leagues, to be happy to be in the Ivy Leagues, but, but not quite on the, the same playing field. And with Swearer, that, that feeling vanished, and Brown started competing very effectively for, for the best students in the country and in, in the world, and starting programs um, like the Watson Institute and, and others that uh, didn't necessarily look to other Ivies for, for example or for permission and just sort of doing things its own way. And that, uh, that self-confidence has never vanished on this campus and is probably um, higher, better developed than it ever has been and just keeps getting better year after year after year. So the part of me that is a historian that tries to resist triumphant narratives, we're supposed to be a little more cynical than that, wanted to avoid ending on, on a note of pure triumph. But the part of me that grew up on this campus and saw how far Brown has come knew that I had to end on that kind of a note because it is true. It is true that Brown has become a great national and international institution and every year the yields, the yield figures of admissions goes down and I see the most brilliant students I've ever met in my life come through these doors and then leave these doors and go on to be even more incredible people as alumni than they are as, as students. And so it is a place of magic and history and imagination that just keeps getting better. So I'm hoping an even better history is written in 50 years than, than this one. But I like the confidence of this book. It feels to me like a confident book. It's well made. You know, it has great invitations. It has a, 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 um, illustrations. It has a great cover. It's a solid book. And I, I didn't want a book that felt deferential to the other universities out there. I wanted a book that celebrated the unique achievements of this unique place of higher learning. So I feel proud about it. And I. I really enjoyed working with Eve and Kat and the design team, as I said, and I, I'm now just really looking forward to the, the response of, of readers. So um, if, if you buy the book and you want to either argue against me or say that you like something, I hope you'll send me an email. I, I want to thank Tom Tisch, who I just saw, uh, the chancellor of Brown University, who's been a, a real friend to this process and was a friend in my time at the JCB and cares a lot about Brown's history and, and a lot of early, early American history in different, different categories. So thank you, Tom, for what, what you did. And I hope all of you will feel in, in the different, in different ways you represent different constituencies of Brown that I, I got it right. It's impossible to get everything right and it wouldn't be in the Brown spirit to, to admit to omniscience, but I think I, um, I told a pretty lively story and I hope you feel the same way. So why, why don't I stop? As usual, I talked a little too long, but if there are questions, I'm very happy to take them.